Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here. We are in uh, Malachi chapter 3. We're looking at the uh, fifth dispute. We won't get all the way through it. I'm going to stop in verse 6 and spend some time in verse 6, and then we'll come back to this next week. Uh, But this fifth dispute is uh, focusing on the fact that God is saying, I have not changed. Now, again, it's, it could be translated in your... It's in the perfect tense, the, the verb changed. And so it can be God does not change, which is a true statement. You know, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God's not changing. Uh, and that's fine. And it's translated that way. It's a correct translation. But also a correct translation is that God has not changed. I, and it puts the, into the context there, the problem is not with God. He's, he's made a covenant and he has not changed. And the problem is, he refers to, this is going to be a, a, a contrasting statement. God has not changed and Israel has not changed. They're still the same. They're still in rebellion. And so what he's going to be talking about is the problem is not on my end. The, because I'm still faithful to the covenant, the problem is on your end because you're still violating the covenant, which is going to bring up again tonight our context of Ab- Abra- Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant. And again, I have a trouble spelling, and then I have a hard time really spelling when I start talking while I'm spelling. I'm spelling a word that I said four sentences ago, and I forget what the word is. And then the Mosaic covenant. Uh, again, if I spell something wrong, I don't mind being corrected because uh, and I wrote Trajan wrong on the board last night. It's spelled with an E, and then the whole, for like 20 minutes, it, it's there in the background. This statement is saying right here on the board, this guy does not know what he's talking about. Yeah. So I, some people will be smart and get rid of the, the board, but I, I'm not smart either. So here it is. Uh, the Abrahamic covenant is an example of a unconditional covenant you you know this it's foundational but it's very important for our our conversation tonight meaning god makes a promise and he says i am going to do this and you just receive the benefit of the covenant because god is basing it all on himself the mosaic covenant is a conditional covenant where there's two sides of the covenant god says i will do this for you but you are going to have to do this it's like signing a a, uh, a, a lease on a house or something i will live here they'll let you live there but you're going to have to pay this much money in this covenant right here would be god is simply going to make a promise i'm going to give you this house and you can live in this house uh, now again if you choose to do that or not but those are the difference and in this context tonight that's going to be very huge uh, I'm going to read through this. I've got on the notes. I've only got notes for uh, chapter 3, verse 6. But I do have on the back page the rest of the fifth dispute that I'll read through so we get the whole context. But this begins uh, the, the fifth dispute. Now again, it is possible that chapter 3, verse 6 goes is the ending, the end statement of the fourth dispute we talked about last week. So this is either ending the fourth dispute or it's the introduction to the fifth dispute. It's, it's in between those. So I've, I've put it here. I've got a couple commentaries that put it at the end. Uh, but that's not important tonight, although I do want you to think about it. But here it is, Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. Uh, it says, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore... You, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. And that's, that's, that's the give and take of it. Then the rest of the dispute would go like this. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? And, and it's the attitude is, what, why do we need to return? What have we done? And then, so now here's the accusation. Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? Meaning, we haven't robbed you. Give us some proof. And it's okay. And he says, in your tithes and contributions. 
uh, some translations say tithes and offerings, but the ideal is your tithes and your contributions to keep the temple service functioning, which was part of the Mosaic Covenant. And then he goes on and says, uh, the verdict is, you are, a, you are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the, into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. And the test would be, if you'll keep your end of the covenant, watch me keep my end of the covenant. But you're not keeping yours, and so I'm cursing you, because that is part of the covenant. Uh, put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. And again, that is not new information. That's simply a restating of the Mosaic Covenant. It's not like, oh, hey, we didn't know that. We better write this down. That's the prophet saying, here's what's wrong. You're not doing your part and God's not doing his. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field uh, and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear says the Lord of hosts. Then and here's again here's an important verse verse 12 then all nations will call you blessed for you will be a land of delight says the Lord of hosts. Again throughout this book what God does with Israel eventually all the nations are looking at what God is doing and eventually they are going to come to the Lord and the knowledge of God is going to spread and the offerings are going to be offered throughout the nations. Now, uh, we left off last week, if I go back to chapter 3, uh, reading in the NIV, uh, chapter 3, verse 1, See, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Uh, then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come. And again, I, I made the point, and I, I think it's correct, but that seems to be prophetic about John the Baptist coming and introducing the Messiah, Jesus, who is the Malachi or the messenger of the covenant, which is the new covenant. And so this is talking about something that's going to be replacing uh, the Mosaic Covenant, as far as the, the plan right here, uh, it's going to make the Mosaic Covenant, like Hebrews talks about, make the Mosaic Covenant obsolete. And then we went through the book of Hebrews on Sunday mornings and compared them. And the whole book of Hebrews is saying, stop trying to follow the Mosaic Covenant. God has given you a better covenant. In fact, this new covenant was promised in the Old Testament that it was coming and that the Mosaic Covenant would pass away. Now, that's, that's important, that concept, because the Mosaic Covenant is not the Abrahamic covenant. In fact, this Jesus, this Messiah, who was foretold in the Mosaic covenant, was promised uh, in the Abrahamic covenant. He was promised in the Garden of Eden. So this right here, this Messiah, this Jesus, this messenger of the new covenant, is part of the promise of the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. For God to get where he wants to with the Abrahamic covenant, he's going to have to have this new covenant to fulfill and continue the Abrahamic covenant. Again, this new covenant will make the old covenant null and void. We're, we're not going to, you're, you're not dependent on that anymore if you are in, in Christ. Now that's kind of where this goes now. Uh, then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant, whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he, he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire and a launder's soap. So everybody's looking forward to this, but when he comes, he's not just going to seal the new covenant, he's also going to bring judgment to those that need it. They're going to have to come to him to be refined. Uh, he will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, you know, soap and fire, and he will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Now, when I talked about Levites here last week, we talked about the priesthood. Now, here's a, a slippery slope or something that needs to be clarified because Jesus is going to purify a people from himself that's going to become a priesthood that are going to offer up rightful sacrifices we see that in the new testament peter talks about it we see that the the offerings of, of prayer or the offerings of bringing the gentiles to the lord all these are 
something done by the new priesthood established in the new covenant. But yet, uh, that does not mean the Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant as far as the Levites, because now he's going to mention here again, and this again is important to navigate through, it says, uh, he will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness, and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in the days gone by, as in former years. So there is, in this verse, the ideal of the new covenant and a priesthood in the church, uh, not offering in a temple because you are the temple, but yet also, as throughout the Old Testament prophecies, of coming back to, again, the Mosaic Covenant and the Levitical priesthood. But all of that is corrected because of this messenger. And the Levites will be purified. And it does say, as in the former days, just like we originally started, you're going to be purified so you can do your job as a Levite in the Mosaic Covenant. Uh, and then verse 5, So I will come near to you for judgment... And that would be to purify them. But also, if they're not willing to go through the purification process, I'll be quick to testify against, and then he gives you a list of all the wickedness, the sorcerers, adulterers, perjurers, it means liars, against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widow and the fatherless and, de and deprive the aliens of justice. But do not fear me, says Yahweh Almighty. And then verse 6, the Lord uh, I, the Lord, do not change, so you, descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. And he picks up with that. So with that being said, their talking appears to be the coming of the messenger of the covenant and his forerunner, establishing the new covenant, which obviously puts us into the New Testament where we can see, if it be in, in Peter, uh, 1 Peter, if it be in 1 Timothy, if it be in Paul's writings, we are a priesthood bringing correct sacrifices to God in this new covenant. Not in a temple made by hands, but yet we've got all these Old Testament prophecies talking about uh, the restoration of Israel, talking about the purification of the Levites, about bringing correct sacrifices in a physical temple. We've got Ezekiel and throughout the Bible talking about the temple being restored. Uh, even in the millennial age, and that causes a problem for, for many people uh, because it's like, how can you have the new covenant and a spiritual temple, but also then have Israel still functioning as a physical nation in a physical temple? What we're going to see is in the Abrahamic covenant, uh, Jesus is going to be, uh, it, it, Paul makes a point of it, the promises were made to Abraham and to his seed. It doesn't say, and it, Paul makes a point of this, it doesn't say seeds, plural. Paul says this, it says seed, singular, meaning in the Abrahamic covenant is going to become one seed that is going to be productive. And that seed is going to be Jesus. And he is going to be the seed that something grows from. The tree is going to grow from. And now this tree is going to be Israel, a physical nation, but grafted in through the Abrahamic covenant, we're going to see Paul talk about this, is going to be the church is grafted in and is growing from this same seed, except it's not a natural seed, it's a spiritual seed. It's growing in the same tree along with Israel. Israel is not the seed. Israel is the tree growing from the seed, and the church is going to be grafted in. Israel is going to be, the branches are going to be cut off because they're disobedient, but Paul's going to say they will be grafted in again. You be careful so you don't get cut out. And the ideal there is God is looking for a true, true seed, or, or, or a true tree growing from the seed. Meaning you can lean a board up against the tree and say, oh look, there's a branch. It's not really connected to the tree. It's, it's a board separated. And so Israel can be part of this Abrahamic covenant as far as believing like Abraham, or they can just be 
boards leaning against the tree that are not really branches or just you know something disconnected same thing the church can profess to be believers go to church do all the institutional things but you're really not part of the tree and so israel true israel is believing israel that they believe in the savior they believe in we would just simply say the promise and sometimes the promise has more details like abraham was not told there's going to be a messiah born of a virgin he will be god eternal becoming man call him emmanuel he will then die on a cross for the sins of the world but be resurrected in three days and so do you believe this abraham what uh, abraham couldn't process that god simply told abraham I'm going to make a great nation out of you, and through you, all the nations will be blessed. Your descendants will be as numerous as the stars. He took him outside and showed him the stars, and it says Abraham believed God, and God credited him as righteousness. Now, what did he know about the promise? I'm going to make you a great nation. Your descendants, your physical descendants will be as numerous as the stars, but because of you becoming a nation all nations are going to be blessed are you on board with that abraham do you believe that it's like abraham believed the lord and it was credit to him as right abraham became a believer and so is a prototype of all believers of all time god makes a promise do you believe that yes and abraham believed now we're up further on in history so we can hear abraham's promise we can hear the the voices of the prophets and the promises that were made through jeremiah and isaiah daniel we can hear a variety of promises especially specifically talking about the messiah and salvation and the cleansing work he's going to do the suffering servant of christ isaiah had a message about a suffering servant that who who would believe the message and he would be bruised for our iniquities it's like do you believe that i believe that who who is this guy well if you don't know his name jesus you can't be saved well abraham didn't know his name isaiah didn't know his name david didn't know his name but they all knew that god had made a promise and they're believing the promise now we've got a whole bible full of promises we've got details and we can believe the message for example jesus was promised he came he died for the sins of the world he was resurrected uh, indicating the work was done the payment for sin was done and we are righteous in christ if you will believe the promise not if you'll join the club or sign the card or you know say that you think there is a god it's like do you believe the promise and so that is a true believer would be like abraham you believe the promise israel could be a true believing nation or an individual in israel could believe whatever promise level level of the promise had been revealed they could believe it or as a member of the church you can believe the promise at whatever level you've got and again we we gone monday nights we're going through the so the heresy so there are some basic things that we want to hold to because we can we can build some you know that jesus was born of a virgin that he was truly god he was truly man and he died on the cross for our sins we by faith can be saved and we go through all what we'd say the creeds on a, a correct statement uh but there is the ability to be in israel and just go through the motions and not really be israel you're you're a, you're a seed of abraham physically but you're not a seed of abraham spiritually you haven't believed the promise you can be in a church you can be in a christian community you can be you can be one of jesus 12 disciples and not really believe the promise you can use the use the situation you can use the people in the church you can use whatever position you've got around believers like judas but you're going to be cut off because you're not a true believer so there can be true israel and there can be israel that's merely physical israel there can be true church or true believers or there can be just a physical church in some kind of community and you don't really have faith you don't really and that's 
again, why the Word of God is so important, because if you don't know the Word of God, if you don't know the promise, uh, you can't be a believer. What are you believing? I'm just believing that, you know, we should all do good things. Well, what, what's, what's good? I mean, a communistic good, a socialist good, a, you know, a good in South uh, United States or good in New York or good California good? I mean, what good are you talking about? That, that's not, that's, you're making it up now. Okay, here we go. On page one of the notes, uh, very quickly, I just got some bullet points to introduce this fifth uh, uh, dispute. Uh, it contains two parts. One is a, uh, a call for repentance and then a call for the tithe. There are three pivotal statements that Yahweh makes in this fifth dispute. Uh, he says, one, I do not change, which puts the pressure on the people. And then says, return to me. And then says, test me in this. Do what I say and don't doubt that I'm going to do what I promised. Malachi, uh, the third bullet point, is speaking for Yahweh. And again, I paraphrase some of these statements, kind of give you a feel for what's going on. Malachi speaking for Yahweh and the Israelites' response to the prophet flow like this. Malachi speaking for Yahweh says basically, Yahweh made a covenant with Abraham. That is the only reason you have not been destroyed like all the other nations. And that's exactly the way the book began. How, how are we loved? How are we favored? Well, look at Esau. He's... Jacob's brother and he has nothing you're still here because you've got the Abrahamic covenant Israel then says uh, how shall we return and meaning what have we done wrong Malachi provides proof well you're robbing God he's got a covenant with you and you're for example violating the covenant by robbing keeping what's his for yourself Israel says how have we robbed God or Yahweh Malachi provides the proof, tithes and contributions. It's like, we don't have them in the storehouse, you've still got them. And then Malachi makes the declaration of Yahweh's explanation, decision, and restatement of the covenant promise that we see at the end. So here we go, uh, chapter 3, verse 6. For I, the Lord, do not change, therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. The word for or surely is kai in the Hebrew, you can see it right there. It's a particle beginning of two clauses there's going to be a clause of i or yahweh and there's going to be the other clause you or israel and because because this is true this is true if this were not true it would be impossible for this to be true god says i have not changed Therefore, you are not destroyed. If God had changed, like they're accused, well, you're not doing your part of the covenant. He said, whoa, whoa, whoa. If I was not doing my part of the covenant, if I had changed, there would be no sons of Jacob. The only reason you're still here mouthing off to me, sons of Jacob, is because I have not changed. I made a covenant, a promise to Abraham that I would make his descendants as numerous as the stars, and that all nations would be blessed. And you are the sons of Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. You're the sons of Jacob. And so because I made that promise, and I have not changed that promise, you are not destroyed. If I were to change this promise, there would be no sons of Jacob. And so... That's what's being said there. It could be, uh, Kai could be translated for, surely, because, if, indeed. NIV, if you have an NIV Bible like I've got here in front of me, doesn't even bother to translate it. Just forgets it. Doesn't think it's necessary. Uh, this verse can be also be translated because I, Yahweh, have not changed. You, the sons of Jacob, have not perished. Like I said before, and you can see it on the next page, page 2.a, the perfect tense of the verbs changed and perished support the idea that this should be read as Yahweh has not changed instead of Yahweh does not change. That doesn't mean that's not true. It could be translated that way. You, you'd have a choice. Yahweh has not changed or Yahweh does not change. Either one is fine. 
But then you read the rest of the conditional clause, and it says, the sons of Jacob have not or have not been destroyed. It doesn't mean they are, are, they are not destroyed. The idea is that you have not been destroyed up to this point because I have not changed up to this point. So it could be true. Yahweh cannot change or Yahweh never changes. They could also be, and the sons of Israel are never destroyed. They may be disciplined, they may be punished, they may be corrected, but the sons of Israel have not been destroyed, but also they are not destroyed. They, they can't be destroyed because of that Abrahamic covenant. I mean, it's, it's locked in. Uh, point three, the two contrasting clauses are going to get redundant here in a minute. Yahweh has not changed, referred to I in the contrasting clause. Israel is not destroyed, it is you. Yahweh can refer back to, oh, this is important. Now, this is called Yahweh. I'm going to erase Israel here because it's identified as sons of Jacob. Now, I, 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 I'm going to read into this. You don't have to accept this. Uh, but for example, sons of Jacob, I've got it written down there, is used 15 times in the New Testament. Once in 1 Kings 18, once in 2 Kings 17, and then here in Malachi. Of the 15 times it's used in the Old Testament, 12 of those times come in the book of Genesis, which is right there. It's before the Mosaic Covenant. The sons of Jacob are a du the direct result of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and now here's his sons. So these are the stars as numerous as the heavens. This is the fulfillment of the promise. And God promised Abraham. He didn't say, Abraham, now if you're good and you go to the temple and you, you know, sing songs in church, then I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars. He says, Abraham, I'm going to tell you I'm making a promise. Your descendants will be as numerous as the stars. So these sons of Jacob are, in a sense, the stars that God promised Abraham. And he says, sons of Jacob, the reason you're not destroyed is I haven't changed. Because I promised this to Abraham, you're the stars, you're what I promised. And so you're still here and I'm still putting up with you. Now, if I have changed, you wouldn't even be here. Uh, so Yahweh uh, is used uh, by Moses, in, the word is used in, in the uh, uh, book of Genesis, but it kind of refers to, that's what he was introduced as Yahweh at the burning bush. My name is Yahweh, introduced, what is your name? And so it kind of reminds you of the Exodus, which leads to the Mosaic Covenant. The Mosaic Covenant is a covenant of judgment, meaning if you violate it, there's going to be punishment. So God will punish sin, but God is also, meaning he's holy, but he's also faithful, or hasid is the Hebrew word, hasid, uh, translated love, meaning covenant love. So in the, in the Mosaic Covenant, he can demonstrate his holiness, but he's holding back the holiness of destroying because he also is faithful to the Abrahamic covenant. So you could almost see Yahweh is the God of the Exodus and Mosaic covenant, but he's also got a covenant with Abraham that he's not going to violate that covenant love. And that's the next point there, uh, point five. Point six, Micah 7, verse 18 through 20, declares God's seed. This is just interesting. And I've got underlined there, steadfast love twice, and then the Hebrew word, seed. Uh, which means covenant love. It's translated love. That's, it's nice that they do it right here, steadfast love. It's not an emotional love. It's I've made a commitment and I'm steadfast. I'm not violating this love of this covenant. Nonetheless, Micah 7 says, who is, like, who is a God like you? Pardoning, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance. Now, his inheritance is this, the nation of Israel, the sons of Jacob. And this is Micah. He, pa he passes over judgment, doesn't bring judgment on them. 
He does not retain his anger forever. Now, he does discipline them. We see him, uh, the Babylonian captivity, we see different plagues, and that's part of the covenant of Moses. It's like, you're not following this, and so I'm going to have to discipline you because I've got to keep you on track to get to the end of the game, the end of the process of salvation. He does not retain his anger forever because, why will he not retain his anger forever? Now, against Esau, he will never stop being angry. Against the Moabites, his anger endures forever. His wrath never ends. Once he destroys a nation, they're never coming back. But with Israel, he does not retain his anger forever. Why? Because he delights in steadfast love. It doesn't mean God is all lovey and gooey and hearts and butterflies. It's like, oh, I just like butterflies more than I like lightning. That, that's not the point. Uh, his anger will not endure forever because he delights in keeping his promise that he made with Abraham. I made a promise. I delight in keeping my word. I promise I would do this. I delight in watching my word come to pass. I am going to honor my covenant with Abraham. Now, I may have to discipline you, but I've got to back off because I'd rather fulfill my plan of salvation than just melt you. He will again have compassion on us, Micah writes. He will, now again, Micah's writing before the Assyrian dispersion and the invasions that came to Judah and way before the Babylonian captivity. He's writing a couple hundred years before that. So he will again have compassion on us. He will tread our, our iniquities, watch, he will tread our iniquities underfoot. He himself will crush the sin, not crush us. He's going to crush sin or our iniquities. You will cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. Somehow, he's, God is going to be able to take, I'm not going to crush you for your sins, but I'm going to somehow separate your sins from you. I'm going to crush the sins. I'm going to take the sins and throw them into the sea. I'm going to deliver you from your sins. Now, I mean, I, I, again, we can know uh, uh, yeah, the cross is where that takes place. But you're reading this, how is God, go, in Micah's day, how, how is he going to, separate us from our sins he's not just going to say i'll just cover my eyes and pretend it doesn't exist because he's holy he has to punish sin but somehow he's got to get you removed from the sin before he punishes or somehow remove the sin from you he will cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea this is talking about israel you watch you will show faithfulness to jacob and steadfast love hasid to Abraham. You'll show faithfulness to Jacob. You'll show hasid to Abraham. In other words, he is going to get rid of those sins. Why? Because I promised that I would do it to Abraham. He would do that for Abraham. Because he, somehow he's got to do that for them to become a great nation to bless all the nations. As you watch, you will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love hasid to Abraham as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old from the days of Genesis you made this promise and we know we may go through discipline but it won't last forever because you've got to bring us back because we are the sons of we are the stars that you promised Abraham he was going to have but somehow you're going to have to deal with that sin uh, now, point seven, the curse and the punishments of the Mosaic Covenant is declared. We can read it in Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 26. We've talked about that before. It goes through all the first phase, the second phase. There's five cycles of judgment based, you know, hope for marriage last generation is based on that. The ideal of the Hamas generation receives the fifth cycle of judgment, which is the removal of them from history and that can happen to nations when they get to that fifth cycle and they'll never come back but israel will hit that fifth cycle but because of hasid with abraham they'll cycle back in uh, the failure of the mosaic covenant to make the people holy will result in a new covenant that's jeremiah 31 31 where god promises that he'll make a new covenant now i want to keep moving here i've got a lot of verses to look up here and uh something i want to talk about so you understand the new, new covenant. I will make a new covenant with that. Well, I'm going to read it to you. Jeremiah 31, uh, 31 through 34. Uh, it's referred to in the book of Hebrews also. Jeremiah 31, 31 in the NIV. The time is coming, declares Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant, notice, with the house of Israel 
and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. So this new covenant is replacing what? The Mosaic covenant. It's not replacing the Abrahamic covenant. In fact, the new covenant is an extension of the Abrahamic covenant. He needs this new covenant to get the sin out of the people so Abraham's covenant can come to pass. But it won't be like the Mosaic covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After that time declares the Lord. Watch. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. It's not going to be a bunch of rules and regulations and clean food and unclean food. I'm going to come into them. I'm going to reprogram their mind. I'm going to reprogram their hearts. I'm going to breathe life into them. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, Know the Lord because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest throughout there's no like priests and common it's like you won't have to take your friends and take them to the priest and say teach us about the lord because he'll come to all of you he will not dwell in a building he'll dwell in all of you ezekiel picks this up so that's the new covenant that was promised uh the failure sons of jacob and the mosaic covenant will not destroy yahweh's faithless uh oh let's go with this right here uh if, if the sons of Jacob, now understand this, this is, this is huge for kind of the age we're living in, uh, sometimes because of church theology, sometimes because of world events. Uh, you don't have to agree with what I'm going to say, but I definitely agree with what I'm saying, and I think the Bible does. But when the sons of Jacob fail, or Israel, you know, sons of Jacob uh, they've expanded. We can now call them Israel, the nation. There's been centuries of them now. Uh, when they fail, uh, the Mosaic Covenant, Yahweh will not destroy them. He may punish them. They're still coming back from the judgment of 70 AD because of their, well, crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the rejection of the new covenant. They were dispersed. Uh, but yet they were not totally destroyed. They were not, there is no record in the scriptures that Israel was totally destroyed uh, because you've got Jews throughout the New Testament. You've got Paul. Uh, you've got uh, Barnabas. You've got John, the last apostle. You've got Jews in the book of Revelation. You've got them warning about Jews in the book of Revelation. The seven churches of Asia Minor have Jews. So the Jews at no point are like, and they shall exist no more. There's, depending on what you think about, independent on what you think is going on in Israel, there are Jews alive today. The nation of Israel uh, exists. And you say, well, that's, uh, those aren't really genetically Jews. Well, that, you can argue that case if you want to, but there are still Jews on the earth somewhere. They have not, ex scripturally, they have not been, you don't have a verse. And thus the Jewish nation no longer existed. Thus, the last drop of blood of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was shed, and the Jews ceased to exist. There's not even a hint of that. There's not even a prom In fact, there's continuous promises. It can't happen. In fact, that's one of Satan's goals, is if he could say, and that was the last drop of Jewish blood. It's like, that's what he's trying to do. Because that would nullify our entire religion. That would entire, the entire Bible would just, I, the, the universe would blow up first. Okay, I'm trying to find some way of explaining that. That's all over the top, I know. But nonetheless, so in Romans chapter 11, let's just flip over to Romans chapter 11. I, I'm going to fly through several things here if I can. In Romans chapter 11, which is a classic verse for this topic, uh, is chapter 11, verse 1. This is Paul writing to the Romans, 57 A.D. And this is an issue today, theologically, uh, and it, it, becomes, it can become political. It can become uh, world... Uh, 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 conflict 
You talk about Hamas and the Gaza Strip and Muslims and Israel. But here we go, chapter 11, verse 1. This is the Bible. Paul says, I ask then, did God reject his people? He says, by no means. It means absolutely not. It, and that's, that's a way of say, saying, in, in a sense, the universe would have to blow up first. The, the heaven and earth would have to pass away before God would reject his people. Now, would he discipline his people? Yes, I mean, we are, in, when he's writing this, we're 13 years away from the temple being burned down for the second time. And Paul knows it's coming. Jesus knew it was coming. He says, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham, meaning I'm one of the stars in the heavens. From the tribe of Benjamin, God did not reject his people whom he foreknew, don't you know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah? And it goes through and talks about that now. So that's right there, point uh, eight on page, or point nine on page two. Uh, the failure of Jacob's sons in the Mosaic Covenant will not destroy Yahweh's faithfulness. R Romans 11, 1, by no means. Failure of, the Mosaic, failure of the Mosaic Covenant was not total and not final. In chapter 11, verses 1 through 10, uh, if they did fail the Mosaic Covenant, again, when they failed the Mosaic Covenant, there was discipline. It's worked into the Mosaic Covenant. Again, I'm pointing out Abrahamic Covenant, unconditional, Mosaic Covenant, conditional. If you violate this, th those who violate this will die. That's in the covenant. This is a promise. So when they violate the Mosaic Covenant, did that nullify this? It, it's, it's disconnected. And so they were, it was not total, it was not final. And in Romans chapter 11, verse 26, look at that very quickly. Uh, we're going to look more at these verses. Uh, chapter 11, verse 25. Paul says, I do not want you ignorant of this mystery. Mystery, that means you can't, you can't sink your teeth into it. That means you can't wrap your academic mind around it. it it's, it's a mystery. It's like, it, it, it's difficult to understand. You're going to have to accept it by faith. It's almost like, well, these two things both can't be true. What do I mean? Well, Jesus is eternally God, so he can't be a man. No, no, no. Jesus has to be a man. He has to be a physical man. Oh, well, then, if you're a man, you can't be eternally God. Well, no, behold, a mystery. The mystery of Emmanuel. He is eternally God, and he became one of us. Okay, now again, we can handle that. We can understand that. We, we can all agree on that. But when you actually start putting it together, it's like, how can he be one of us, a created being, if he's always been here and he's God? Or if he's one of us, how can he be eternal? It's like, yeah, it works. Or the Trinity. The three are one. Explain that mathematically. It all makes sense. The same thing here. He's talking about Israel. I do not want you ignorant of this mystery. You're going to have a hard time putting it together, brothers, so that you may not be conceited, meaning arrogant, teaching something that is not true. Israel has experienced a, a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in. Right there, watch. Israel is still in existence in 57 A.D. He doesn't say, well, Jesus died, was resurrected, the Holy Spirit came on the church in Jerusalem, Israel is no longer an issue. Israel, it's just a matter of time, the clock is ticking, tick-tock, tick-tock, and you're just going to fade away into obscurity, just like Moab and Edom and the Babylonians. You're just going to pass away because the church is here now. Well, if that was 30 A.D., then 35 A.D., then 45 A.D., then 55 A.D., now 57 A.D., after that should have began the clock, he says, uh, uh, where am I reading? Israel has experienced a hardening in part. Israel, who is still here, what's wrong with them? They've experienced a hardening. Their heart is hard, but it's in part. Why can he say in part? Because it's not nationwide. Because Paul, I'm a Jew, and Peter's a Jew. There's a whole bunch of Jews that followed Christ into the church. 
Israel, who still exists, has experienced a hardening in part, and then the clock will start to tick, tock, tick, tock until the last drop of Jewish blood has been shed and Israel is no more. No, no, no. A hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in. In other words, this is temporary. The gospel, just like it says in uh, Genesis, through Abraham, all nations will be blessed. Well, the seed came, the seed died, the seed was resurrected, and all the Gentiles can now be blessed through the seed, singular, of Abraham, and the full number of Gentiles. Now, all Gentiles could be saved. But they're going to come into and join the church. They're going to come in and join those who believe. They're going to be those that are redeemed. Now, we're waiting for... Now, not all of them are. There's going to be a certain... The full number. Now, I don't know if what that number is. I'm not sure where that number came from. But there's a full number. And when that happens then this hardening in part, this temporary, this will break open until the full number of Gentiles has come in. And so, when that happens, all Israel will be saved. And he says, as it is written. Now, he's got a verse. I've got two more. All Israel will be saved. Now, that hardening in part, once the full number of Gentiles has come in, now, the gospel has gone to the Gentiles. So all the Gentiles are in the church? No, those have come in, the full number. And when it says all Israel, watch, the full number of Gentiles have come in. Have all the Gentiles come in? The full number, all the Gentiles have been saved. Now, there's many of them that are, are going to perish. But when that's taken place, then all or the full Israel will be saved. So that means every last Israelite will be saved at that time. No, the full number. There's going, to be, there's going to be those that are going to believe at that time. They can't see it now, but the day is coming where the veil is going to be taken away and those who believe are going to come in and accept the Messiah. And here it is, right here. Here's his verse. And so all Israel will be saved. I don't think you should interpret that. Every last person in Israel will be saved. There will be a mass revival among the Jews accepting the Messiah that they've pierced. As it is written, the Deliverer, that means Messiah, the Savior, will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. When he returns, he's going to do what he says. He's going to remove their sins and throw them into the sea. And this is my covenant with them when I, when I take away their sins. Meaning, this is the covenant I have. I will come, I'll take away their sins, and that's the covenant I've got, which is not the Mosaic covenant. It's going to be this new covenant with Israel. It's going to be saved. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies on your account. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved. That means steadfast love. That means Hasid. It's not the word Hasid. It's a Greek word. But they are loved on account of who? The Mosaic Covenant? No, the patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because they are the seed of Jacob or the sons of Jacob. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Now you say, oh, I've even got that highlighted in blue, and they got an orange square drawn around it. Because in my Bible, blue is uh, the, the God speaking. Again, an important part that I want to remember, because you could just color your whole Bible blue. But then orange, for me, indicates spirit, the spirit of God, or spiritual gift. So for me, that for God's gifts and his calling are irrevocable, I have the gift of teacher. That is a gift from God. It's irrevocable. Now, I can mess it up, but God is not going to take it from me. It's a, his gifts and callings are irrevocable. And I've got it squared in orange. You see how that ties into spiritual gifts? No. It's the nature of God that when he gives something, he's not going to take it away. In context, what is the gift that he's not going to take away? The Abrahamic covenant. Why will all Israel be saved? Why is the deliverer going to come out and take Jacob's sins away? Because 
is covenant is ir- it's the same thing we're saying in, in Malachi chapter 3, verse, I look and remember where we're at. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. Because I, the Lord, have not changed, because I, the Lord, give gifts and my callings are irrevocable, the seed of Jacob is not destroyed. And because his gifts and callings are irrevocable, because he does not change, he has not changed, when, it's, when we're done with this age right here, he's returning back to finish this promise. Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound all men over to disobedience, the fall of man, so that he may have mercy on them all. And then it goes on and talks about the depths and riches of God's wisdom. And so that's, that's, again, a part of what we're talking about right here. So there's nowhere in here that the seed of Abraham, the nation of Israel, the flesh and blood of Abraham, stops. In fact, they've got to be there as a nation in the end for God to fulfill his promise that he says is, it's irrevocable. I cannot not do that. I mean, heaven and earth will pass away before the seed of Abraham is not there in the end. Jesus said that heaven and earth will pass away before my word passes away. And when I made a covenant with Abraham, your descendants will be as numerous as the stars of heaven. Are you sure? Well, I'll tell you what. The whole universe is going to have to melt, go back into the point of plank time of before it began, just evaporate if the Jews are not there when I finish my work with the church. And so that's, that, that's a huge, I think, statement. Now, again, people are going to want to, some are going to want to jump and dance around that. Uh, and that leads us to point two, or bottom of page two, and tick tock, tick tock. Here we go. Just a real quick presentation of what, what it's, it's called, uh, and you've heard about it. Every one of you's heard about it or wondered about it or someone you know believes it or try to convince you of it. And uh, I don't think it's right, but, you know, I'm a mere man teaching the Word of God, and I can be wrong, but I'm definitely going to stand against this because I understand what I've just explained to you. I, it's, it's clear. Uh, but if you take and create, I'm going to use the word framework, uh, now, be careful because that's the name of my book, Framework for Christian Faith, I know. But if you create a framework, say, this is what I believe, and then you go to the Scriptures and you find a, a certain verses, you say, you know, text verses, text out of, out of context. And then you spiritualize things. Oh, look, this is what Jesus said. But that's not what he was talking about. Just like I put a square around that, God's gifts and callings are irrevocable. I think it can apply to spiritual gifts, but it's clearly not in context of spiritual gifts to the individual believer. The nature of God stays the same. You can make the application, but I sure wouldn't want that to be my text verse. Uh, It could be a supporting verse. Text verse, uh, a a, a spiritual, or they have a misinterpretation. The interpretation is, is twisted. And they create this, and then they go to the Bible, and then they present this to you, it's called, with this framework, they can use, and they shove all their verses into this framework they've created. Now, they would say the same thing about me and my dispensational teaching. And we'll, we've talked about that. We can do more of that later. But they've got right here, point 10, it's called covenant theology. Again, you can study it yourself. You can read about it yourself. There's churches in town. Uh, heck, some of you may go to a church like that. Uh, which, again, I apologize. I'm sorry, I don't want to be trampling all over your doctrines. But uh, covenant theology also is like a, 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 something they would not like embrace, but it's the buzzword for it. It's replacement theology. Is Israel was God's chosen people until they failed. And when they failed, they killed Jesus. It's like, forget these guys. I'm now going to start the church. And the Jews, 
that be believed, they became part of the church, but the church has replaced Israel. Now, dispensationally, Israel, Paul says, has experienced the hardening in part, and they've been set aside, and we are in this age that I call, dispensationally called the church age, waiting for Jesus to return, uh, when the full number of Gentiles has come in. So, yes, Israel's been set aside, but Israel is not like the last drop of blood's been shed, they're gone. They're still here. The clock's not even running for them to disappear. We're just, if it's running, it's just waiting until the time the veil is taken away. And they'll still be there. But replacement theology means the church receives all the promises back here to Abraham, all the promises, even of the Mosaic Covenant. Israel failed all of that, and all these promises are given to the church. But from here... The physical promises of the physical land, promised to Abraham, promised to uh, Moses, promised in Jeremiah, Ezekiel, throughout. All the, the physical blessings of the land, the, the material possessions, the earth, that all in the transference becomes spiritual. It becomes spiritualized. And so... The Jerusalem is not the city Jerusalem. It's heaven far, far away. The city built by God. The temple is not the rebuilt temple of Jerusalem. It's the temple in heaven. It's the presence of God. Uh, the earth is not the earth, and the nations are not the nations. All this stuff is far, far away in heaven. Uh, it becomes spiritualized. Now that means every, th every verse we've read, every promise we've read, going through all the prophets that we've gone through about God saying, I will, you can count on, I'm going to, you will take place here, this will happen here, I will put you back in the land. I, all those promises, he was just talking metaphorically. They thought he was talking about the land and prosperity and, and blessings and, and the nations and and peace on earth. And all he was talking about is, no, no, no. I was just, it was just like a big cheerleading squad. Really, all we're going to do is go to heaven, and it's going to be even better there. So, I, I just didn't know what to say. I was just promising you stuff that uh, I'm not ever going to do, but I knew you wouldn't understand heaven. So, I'll just say Israel, the land of Israel. It's like, oh, so you weren't serious? Well, no, I'm I, it's just the word of God. It's, I'm not seriously going to bless Israel, the seed of Abraham in the land of Israel, which I described your boundaries or your borders like 13 different times. Uh, and you're still there today in 2024, and there's still a war there trying to drive you out. No, that's just, that's just bad theology. In fact, if you understood what I was saying, you wouldn't even defend Israel because they're not even really a people. The, they're, not even worth, they're not even supposed to be there. I mean, and so just join with this spiritual group, and uh, the church has replaced Israel, replacement theology. That, that is, again, what that's, obviously I, I dramatize that a little bit, and people that are uh, covenant theology will, will hate that, but I think they are wrong. Uh, in the replacement theology, it's rooted in, it's rooted in basically three covenants. This is how they break it down. They're going to have, first of all, again, this might be new for some of you, uh, covenant of redemption. Covenant of redemption. This covenant of redemption is not a covenant that God made with man, with Abraham, with Israel. This is a covenant that the Trinity made. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit before the Big Bang, before let there be light uh, I, I don't, not trying to make it teach theistic evolution or anything there. Uh, but they decided, they made a covenant with each other. Now this is not really mentioned in the Bible. Uh, you can take some verses about God's plan, God's foreknowledge, and then kind of fill in the blanks. But you've got to develop, first of all, a framework. And once you have that framework, this makes complete sense. 
in this uh, covenant uh, point one, covenant among the members of the Trinity, it was agreement between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Son agreed to become a man and obeyed the demands of the covenant of works, which we haven't talked about yet, because man is going to be given a covenant of works that he's going to fail on. And when man fails that, the Son is making it before it even begins. He says, I'll, I'll pay, take care of that. And to pay for sin. That was his part of the covenant. The Father agreed to, when the time came, to give the Son. For God has given us the Son. A Son has been given. Uh, so the Father promises, okay, when it's time, I'll give the Son. The Son will do the work, pay for the sin. And it's not real clear what the Holy Spirit does, but they're part of the covenant. They're kind of just like, he kind of just came in and he's going to empower everybody, oversee the whole thing, and make sure all the plan goes according to the covenant. But that's the covenant of, of redemption that was made before the Garden of Eden. Now, you can imagine if that covenant gets broken, if the son says, well, heck no, I'm not going. Or the son says, I've changed my mind. I'm not going to give my son Satan. You can do it and send Satan to die on the cross or whatever. That would blow up the whole, that would be a disaster for the human race. So thank God they kept the covenant of redemption. But it's hard to break it because it's made between God and himself. Then became the, came the covenant of works. Now, this is the first covenant of works, and it begins in the garden. And the covenant of works is always going to be, God says, what I would call a covenant of works, I call that a conditional covenant. If you do this, I'll do this. Welcome to the garden. Now, it's not real clear that there's a covenant, although it does refer to a Adam breaking the covenant. Uh, Paul refers, oh, no, uh, oh, the prophet, the prophet, one of the prophets, uh, we went through it, I'm thinking, I can almost, Amos, I think Amos refers to it, that Adam broke the covenant that he had. But nonetheless, when uh, they ate from the tree, and it was a very simple covenant, don't eat from the tree, and then you can stay here. They ate from the tree, death comes. Well, that is the first, and the Mosaic covenant would be a covenant of works. But all these covenants that are of works, uh, they all fail. And that's why the Son has to come and pay for the failure of all the covenants of works. And then there's going to be the last one uh, that I'll mention, the covenant of grace. The covenant of grace. And that is anything... I would say, the con unconditional, pro anything that's just based on a promise. God gives you a promise, I'll do this. And that would include the Abrahamic covenant. Of course, uh, they're not going to push that because that would undermine their whole uh, s framework. So the Abrahamic covenant is going to be part of the Mosaic covenant because they can't have the Abrahamic covenant here. But it'd be the new covenant. And it basically includes Jesus, the Son, coming and doing this work. And it, it's a promise. Since man failed the works covenant, God will supply another means of bringing the blessing. Point B, with this idea, the covenant with Israel has been set aside and the covenant of grace has replaced Israel. And all the covenants of work have been replaced with this covenant of grace. But to get rid of uh, these covenants, you're going to have to get rid of Israel because many of those covenants were made with Israel. So the covenant of grace is now... Just the church, the promises to the church, and the church has replaced all of this, and the nation of Israel is no longer needed. Uh, the church will now spiritually fulfill all the promises given to physical Israel. So like the millennium, the thousand-year reign, thousand years doesn't mean a thousand years, and earth doesn't mean earth. A thousand years means eternity, and earth means heaven. If, I mean, you probably need to go to seminary to understand that uh, switch. Uh, but anyway, those that disagree are just not very smart. They don't understand the framework. And you probably don't understand Calvinism either, which also needs a framework before you introduce it. But that's another conversation. Um, uh, three errors that are made here. They isolate Scripture. They use proof texts out of context. Like when I say isolate Scripture, that's what I was doing. Uh, his callings are irrevocable. And I just take that, put it on a bumper sticker. Yeah, but put it back in context. It's like, you know, you can make an application to it. But 
isolate scripture, proof text, and then spiritualize everything. Point 11, God is not finished with Israel. God will complete his plan and fulfill his promise to Israel. Israel and the church are two separate works of God. And here we begin something I'm not going to get to tonight, and I'll have to do it next week. Because I think it's important as we finish, we're finishing the Old Testament as far as the prophets. And uh, I, I want to kind of iron this out and, and get it taken care of. But here, for example, Matthew 20, here's, here's some of the text verses covenant theology would use. Uh, Jesus says, therefore I tell you. Now watch this, powerful verse in support of covenant theology. Therefore, Jesus says, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. Do we need any more evidence? The covenant was taken from Israel and given to the church, and we're done. Except uh, point A, Matthew 23 through 9. For I tell you, he says, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Talking to Israel. You won't see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, until you recognize me as Messiah, and then you'll see me again. In other words, he leaves the door wide open. In fact, promises, you will see me again, but that's the day you're going to be saying, blessed is he, and identify me. Again, I've got other things I could show you in, in the Old Testament. Luke 13, 29. And the people will come from the east and the west and from the north and from the south and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. So they're coming from all around distance, coming here that Jesus said this. Acts 1, 3. Now watch this, and I, I'm, I've got to quit. Acts 1, 3. This is Luke beginning the book of Acts, that Jesus presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking to them about the kingdom of God. And the Jews, the disciples who heard him talk about the kingdom of God, understood him to be talking about Israel in the land, in the kingdom of God with the Messiah back. That's what they understood. Are you sure? Well, that's the next verse, chapter 1, verse 6 through 8. So when they had come together, they, they're, he's going to ascend into heaven now. They asked him, because he says he taught them about the kingdom of God during those 40 days. And so now they're putting things together. The Messiah's come, he's died, he's been resurrected, paid for the sins. We're understanding this. So now, is it the end times? Are you now going to restore the kingdom of God and all the nations are going to stream to Israel? Is it now? So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, Will you at this time, 30 A.D., or 33 A.D. if you want, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus says, Oh, you foolish and slow of heart. You think like little children. I'm replacing Israel with the new body, with the Spirit of God. What do you think was going on on the day of Pentecost, which hasn't happened yet? No, he didn't say that. He doesn't say, no, you haven't understood a thing I've said. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons. That's like saying, Dad, are you coming home? It's like, well, I can't tell you exactly when I'll be here. So you're never coming home again. That means I can't, I don't, I'm not going to tell you the exact time. There's, I mean, the, indica the way it's written by Luke, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that I will be establishing the kingdom. Yeah, I'm going to, but I'm not going to tell you when. That's part of the mystery. You've got to live by faith. I'm not telling you when it's going to happen. But he certainly doesn't say, you stupid disciples. That's never going to happen. You're all going to go to heaven. It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but, giving the impression, until that time, but while you're waiting, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And now we pick up Paul, and when the full number of Gentiles has come in, then the veil will be taken off of Israel, and all of Israel will be... Will be uh, uh, will be saved and now we're into the age of the resurrection and that fulfillment okay i've got to quit there just for courtesy sakes but there's just no real 
verses there that give the impression that Israel is done. No, no, no way. Now, set aside for a time, yes, but that they're never going to come back in, or that the church is morphed into Israel, we still are going to see, like I showed you that tree, the seed is the seed of Abraham, Jesus. Israel grew out of that, and the church is also part of that seed. The tree is Israel and the church. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll pray, and we'll pick this up next week, because I think it's kind of important right now for, one, theological reasons, but also in an age where Israel is at war and is losing support in America, it is going to spread like wildfire if it becomes too much of a burden on American taxpayers, for example, it's like, well, you know what? Our pastor was saying Israel's not even supposed to be here, that they're not even a nation. Those people aren't even really Jews. And you can see how it can turn against Israel, uh, especially as Israel's brought back together for a time in history, which is going to manifest in their salvation. Uh, Okay, I, I could keep rambling on and on and on, and I'll quit. All right. Father, we do thank you for the chance to look at these scriptures. We do ask that your word would penetrate our heart, that we not allow our attitudes or any bitterness or, or false teaching interrupt the work of the Spirit and the truth of the Word of God, teaching us, leading us, and guiding us to your light. We ask that we, again, would walk in the fullness of understanding your truth and produce the fruit of the Spirit at this time in history. Again, we ask that we may be part of salvation at this time in history, that we may share the good news with people, and that we may strengthen their faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for your time.